from New York. It's the Power Station Podcast from Berkeley, NYC. I'm your host, Stephen Weber. In this episode, multi-instrumental virtuoso Charlie Rosen of the 8-Bit Big Band shares his experiences from Berkeley to Broadway. Lighting designer and Berkeley alum Eric Marshwinski discusses his company's work on the Need to Breathe Tour, from design ideation to implementation. And we'll take a tour of Power Station at Berkeley NYC's fully renovated spaces, from the classic studios to the new cutting edge video infrastructure. Charlie Rosen is a Tony-nominated multi-instrumentalist, arranger, composer, musical director, and producer. Playing over 70 instruments, Charlie grew up in a musical family in Los Angeles where he learned piano at the age of three. He moved to New York City at 17, immersing himself in the Broadway scene. Charlie also made time to study film scoring and contemporary writing and production at Berklee College of Music. In 2018, Charlie combined his childhood love of video game music with his embrace of the golden era of big bands in his hugely popular project, The 8-Bit Big Band. Charlie's work on Broadway includes the musicals Moulin Rouge, American Psycho, Honeymoon in Vegas, and Be More Chill. Well, Charlie Rosen. Welcome to the Power Station Podcast. Thanks for having me. As I understand, you're the son of a, a professional bassoonist, an organist who also did all sorts of instruments. Yeah. Because you play like every instrument under the sun. I think the New York Times says you played 77 different instruments. Yeah, yeah. They made me count um, all the instruments in my apartment one day. It was pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. How does somebody like you happen? Yeah, my parents are both musicians, like you said. My mom is primarily a bassoon player, but as a woodwind doubler. And my dad's main musical passion is being a silent movie theater organist. So specifically, wow. we have a Wurlitzer pipe organ installed in our house in Los Angeles. I was luckily given access to all these different instruments to just pick up at my leisure when I was growing up and play around with. And, and my parents had the ability to say, okay, well, at least let me show you how to make sound on it, you know, or like how it works. Right. And uh, yeah. yeah, they started me on piano lessons when I was three after they figured out a perfect pitch. I tried cello in, in elementary school for a while. Then when I was in middle school, you know, I was playing in bands with my friends. And so that's when I got really into guitar and bass and drums. And I ended up going to high school as a drummer, actually, playing in big bands. Huh. Yeah, and I thought I was going to go to college and be a drummer. There weren't any upright bass players in this after school big band I was in. So I ended up getting seri really serious about upright bass. And that's what I ended up going to Berkeley for was bass. Around that time, I got serious about brass and I was taking composition lessons centered around piano and so just a little bit yeah. of everything but bass is what I identify with primarily. Talk to me about your time at Berkeley. I understand you spent four semesters there or I know that you're already working a lot right. and then what did you study at Berkeley? What did you get from it? Well first of all I absolutely found my time at Berkeley to be like invaluable to what I do now truly. I mean I, mm -hmm. I can't talk higher about it. I had a really non-traditional yeah. approach to college in that I luckily right out of high school got a gig in a Broadway show in which the gimmick was it had a teenage cast and a teenage orchestra. And so I right. moved to New York after high school to work on that show. And that really got my foot in the door in the theater world. So I was really lucky to be able to know what industry I was sort of falling into and what the demands of that were. And also because I always kind of knew I wanted to be an arranger or an orchestrator, producing music centered around mostly acoustic instruments, but with some electronic stuff, that's right. what I gravitated towards. In Berkeley, it just was like the perfect place for that. I was a, a double major in CWP and film because it's all these writing in different styles. As far as I can tell, not a lot of other music schools offer the breadth of that kind of mm -hmm. musical creation. Yeah, I think and, you're right. You know, you've got the music shops, obviously, but also you've got tech shops. Talk to me about your tech shops. That's definitely an element of my career that has put me a step forward in so many ways. Just being able to communicate with engineers and with people about tech has been a really crucial selling point to say, oh, you know, I'll do this arrangement uh, and I'll make a mock-up of it, put the tempo map into Pro Tools for you and the engineer so everything's ready to go, right. set up with markers, and copy. I, I'll copy the sheet music for you so it looks really nice, it lines up with Pro Tools. <laughs> You know, that kind yeah, of you're stuff. like a one-stop shop here. I mean, it makes a big just, difference. You know. 
and also I time is imagine. money when you're in a studio. You, I, and usually it's my own money right. for my side projects, so I need that stuff to really mm. happen. In COVID times, the music tech skills have been pretty much all I now do. So having the skills to do that luckily allows me to not only provide my services for people who want to do online concerts and things like that, benefits, but also a way to still be creative, you know, with other musicians who have similar skill sets and we can work on things together still remotely. Now more than ever, that has become not just important, but that's it. Like, that's really it right now. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about your music video career. I don't know many people who have done music videos of an entire big band that is, is right. entirely them. Do you edit your own videos? Do you shoot them and edit them? Yeah, you know, there was a scene on YouTube for people that were sort of doing these like split screen things. And I saw those early on mm -hmm. in high school and thought, oh, I want to I want to do some stuff like that. That seems right up my alley. And so now I hire other people to edit my videos mm -hmm. for me and shoot them because I know they're going to look right. a lot more professional. Having the foundation and knowing how to create your own, my own music video content and understanding how editing can be musical, how video editing can be musical, gave me a language to talk to my video editors now and say like, well, here's what's important. And in fact, I found video editors that I can send an, a, a score to, like a full score with little notes on it and say, this is, I want this edit here, I need this hit, I need them this on camera, ah, yeah. which is really great. So it, it gave me a way to communicate with them. How did you write differently for a band that you knew was gonna be entirely yourself? then you might write for a band that was gonna be different people. Right, I definitely write very differently when I know it's for myself. I know my ability well enough to know like, I'm not actually a professional brass player or woodwind player, so I know what I can <laughs> play and what I can't play and what will make me sound right. good and what is too hard. The good news about being able to record yourself and do this stuff yourself is you do write something that's a little bit too hard and then you actually have to practice. So <laughs> it's sort of like teaching the fish right. to fish, right. you know, so like, I set up myself to improve myself. It's like a self-fulfilling thing. You have so many chops and you have so much capacity to do so many different things. How do you decide what's important to you, what your voice and your mission is? Totally. As a career sort of orchestrator, arranger, producer, particularly in the world of theater, we're just required to have so many different kinds of arranging and producing vocabulary and like all these mm -hmm. styles. You know, every Broadway show is a different genre of music that you really, you have to become kind of a chameleon so oftentimes it's hard to think like, okay, well, what is my sound? What is this, what combination of instruments am I actually passionate about? It's really become solidified to me that like my, my thing is always gonna be the sound of contemporary large ensemble. That I think is like the way I define what I love to do. So I guess the thing that's important to me now is finding ways to bring this old and classic style of arranging back into the limelight so that younger arrangers and musicians like myself can become continue to become passionate about it while updating it to be able to have you know a fresh sound in 2020 that really is the thing i love doing the best are there things you're passionate about now that you weren't passionate about necessarily five or ten years ago in five ten years ago i was pretty new to new york and i was just looking to play i was playing every every side person gig i could get you know doing charts for people uh, for free, just to be like, hey, I'll do your horn arrangements for free. If you like them, we keep working together. Yeah. You know, just just grind, just grinding the, uh, pounding the pavement a little bit. And luckily, I'm, I'm in a position now where a lot of that has paid off. What has become really important to me is now to provide gigs with the money I've made for my, my insanely talented musician friends that I've met along the way. I can give them a gig. And I mean, like, that's the most satisfying thing for me is being able to give gigs to these people who really, really deserve gigs in a, in a time when... There aren't a lot of orchestra gigs, you know? I remember when you were at Power Station doing the big session in Studio C. I remember going in and watching and just thinking, man, this is incredibly clever stuff. Awesome. That's Could awesome. you tell us about the 8-bit big band? How did that come about? So right before I left Berkeley, I made this six-song EP of songs from Broadway shows for big band that were sort of reimagined. And I just noticed that Broadway didn't have like a signature big band to call its own, and big band had been my passion. So I started doing that, taking songs from Broadway shows from the from the past and and updating them. And what sparked the inspiration for the 8-Bit Big Band was I went on a trip to Japan and uh, a friend of mine, Zach Zinger, who went to Berkeley, who plays in my band, he's an incredibly uh, talented shakuhachi player. And so I told him, hey, do you know anyone that like maybe give me a lesson? And he thought he was like, oh, I know the perfect guy. He, he loves teaching. And I went to this guy's house in, in Tokyo. He was really nice. He gave me like a two hour lesson on shamisen and, and koto. And he gave me his CD and his CD was a traditional Japanese ensemble, but playing all video game wow. music. And I've always been a lifelong gamer. I've loved gaming and I've loved game music. And I've, I've arranged some game tunes for a big band and like in high school I did. 
but there weren't any like right. dedicated pop style, jazz, pops, contemporary, you know, large ensembles doing it, a dedicated branding. This is a video game pops orchestra. Who makes up your audience? There's, there's this really massive scene for video game music on the internet that I was only a little bit aware of until I started doing this. The word really spreads fast in that scene because they're so communicative on forums and YouTube comments, you know, and Discord servers. They just, they're hungry for good quality video game music bands. There's more demand for it than there are actual artists doing it, it seems like. Talk to me about the 8-bit big band community orchestra. Totally. I'd listen to that and it just sounds amazing. It's massive. Um, How many people do you have on there? What was the process like? What did you learn? I wanted to find a way that I could align the community of fans that the 8-Bit Big Band has created. And I know that there's so many 8-Bit Big Band fans that are musicians, both amateur and professional. They played in high school band, they played in community bands. So I thought, much like everybody else, oh, we should do this virtual orchestra thing. And I thought, okay, everybody's playing Super Smash Bros. I'll do the main theme from Super Smash Bros. Uh, And I put together a fully orchestral arrangement And I opened up the submissions. After a couple days, I had like, you know, 60 to 70 people. I'm like, wow, that's great. That's a huge orchestra. How fantastic. I can't wait. Yeah. But submissions are still open for another six days. And over the course of those six days, it just exponentially grew until we we ended up closing at 664 musicians from 44 countries around the world. That is incredible. Insane. That's incredible. So if you've ever wondered what three bass saxes, four contrabassoons, and five contrabass clarinets sounds like, you just listen to that, get some, <laughs> get a subwoofer and enjoy. How did you organize this? Did you send out a one sheet how to record yourself? How many of these were iPhone recordings versus more professional recordings? I made a fully produced MIDI mock-up. And then I made a version of the mock-up minus each of the sections, right? So minus saxes, minus French horns, minus trombones, minus this, so that the people playing those instruments could just play over the track. And then I used Google Forms to make an instruction thing, you know, record with headphones, uh, record on your phone, please upload only one file, one video file and one audio file. And that that was pretty much it. I tried to just remove as much of the guesswork as possible with that MIDI mock-up and making it as detailed as I could. Then I take it you, you had a video editor that you worked with? Yeah. And it took her like over a hundred hours of video editing in, in a week's time. Wow. Yeah. I have a, the, my oh video team is called Hallelu Productions. They do all my 8-Bit Big Band videos. What a great way to engage with your, with your fans, to have them actually play with you. A lot of people wouldn't have had an opportunity otherwise to sort of go through the process of what it's like to be a professional musician and, and contribute to something that's released professionally. For a lot of people, it really was a, a really cool opportunity, which is really meaningful to me, you know? So you're you're now at the ripe old age of 30. <laughs> what advice would you have for your 20-year-old self? Now, the thing that I guess I learned over the course of the 10 years since I was 20 is, and, and it's still hard for me sometimes, is like, you know, when you're first starting out, you want to say yes to everything, literally everything. Yes, and there's right. a period where you should. My period where it started to become okay for me to say no to gigs that I was Uh, just not committed to. It came Mm -hmm. sooner than I thought it was going to and I wasn't able to recognize it. And being able to say no and not necessarily close yourself off to that person is a really important skill. That's something that every successful musician who has a career has to go through is that initially saying yes to everything. Get your foot in the door, let people get to know you. How do you recognize, you know, when it's time to shift over from that? I have always been a people pleasing person And so it's been hard for me to find a way to not do things that my friends ask me to do. You know, I want to help my friends out. I want to to say yes to people. I want people to be able to depend on me. I think I had to get to a certain point in my maturity level to look at my own emotions and say like, now the reason why I'm unhappy is because I just don't need to be doing this. And it doesn't mean mean I'm bad, a bad person. Doesn't mean they're a bad person for asking me. It's nobody's fault. It's just me being able to recognize my own emotions and why they're happening. So it's kind of a skill that I'm still learning. It's also the thing that I've realized in the past few years, it's being able to recognize like, oh no, I'm not I'm not right for that gig. I'm not right for that gig. You know, you, you need somebody to produce electronic music. I have not really shed of that. Like, and I'm not the right person. And to be able to read between the lines of somebody's email about what they need and go like, thank you so much for asking me, but I think I'm not actually the right person for your gig. And that's okay. It's easy for me to say this and harder for me to do it. But I guess that the advice I'd give to myself and others that are certainly entering the workforce in this time, now more than ever, 
trying to find a thing that you do that is different or that is unique that will set you apart, whether it be online or in person. Right now it's just online. I feel like it's just the most important thing right now. Find a way to create something that feels like really an expression of who you are. And Charlie, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah, man, likewise. The Live Experience Design Specialization prepares students to operate, design, and innovate immersive live events, including concerts, commercial theater, sports, corporate events, broadcast television, interactive installations, and much more. Here at Berkeley NYC, we have the facilities and educational experience necessary to prepare the technician artist to work at this critical intersection of artistic expression and technical innovation. Our main areas of technical focus are sounds, lights, screens, cameras, and interactive performance control. Each of these technical areas has important tools, protocols, and careers that our comprehensive curriculum explores in depth by producing real events with real professionals in a real venue. From the first day of the program, we will be exploring the interconnections between these systems, which is exactly where innovation in live experience production is happening today. Because no matter what type of event, a network of interconnected technologies surrounds the artist and immerses the audience to amplify the stories and inspire the audience's imagination. There are about four phases to this process. Design ideation, technical development, pre-visualization, and implementation. So the process from start to finish is always unique, always different depending on the show, and the pursuit of what is great often takes unexpected turns, and where you started is not always where you end. What's really most rewarding is the process. Technology allows me to create a world that in a sense doesn't exist, and I use it to express my thinking, my art, my feelings, and to connect with people. Technicians, operators are artists. That's why I'm sincerely thrilled that Berkeley is taking on this program and bringing it to New York City because we're going to see a new kind of theater that wasn't possible before. Every artist, every technician, every creative individual is an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur takes risks. There's a blank canvas when you get on stage. And then we create sound and we create light and we create an emotional experience and we touch people. How do you take your creativity, your desire to take that risk, and how do you mold that into someone who's business savvy? And I'm really excited for the next generation because I think they're gonna just blow our mind. For the artist hoping to expand their production skills and build a business around their brand, the Live Experience Design Program offers the perfect place to build your network and hone your skills. Come join us at Berkeley NYC. And now here's Eric Marshwinski, lighting designer and Berkeley alum, with a breakdown of his work on the 2018 tour of the band Need to Breathe. So Early Bird is a design support services company. This means we're helping creatives and designers realize their ideas on stage. There are about four phases to this process. Design ideation, technical development, pre-visualization, and implementation. To better illustrate some of these phases, we're gonna look at a project that we were uh, lucky enough to work on, uh, a tour for Need to Breathe that we worked on in 2018. So this tour, as with every tour, required a, an immense team effort across uh, many different departments and uh, collaborators. So for everyone from the artists to management, designers, vendors, crew, we're working together to create one of this artist's most successful tours to date. Early Bird was hired to produce the touring show, uh, working with their designer, and this included programming and on-site implementation. Uh, we were contacted around May 1st and told that the first show was on August 10th. So this gave us roughly 100, 101 days. We made a production schedule here just to help everybody be on the same page about project deadlines needed. And it was good to set some goals and make sure that we could all make it to the finish line. So the first phase, design ideation. So this started uh, with a lot of input from the artist, a creative phone call, which was great. We totally loved collaborating with these guys. One of them was an actual artist, like a pencil drawing artist, and had a lot of great ideas. So from there, we generate some white models, some 3D models of this in a program called Cinema 4D, and this allows us to look at things in context and get a better idea of scale, shape, and look at some actual dimensions. So we'd given ourselves a deadline of June 1st for this project to solidify a singular design concept. And after we got the artist's feedback, more revisions, we settled on this direction shown here. 
So the next step was technical development. We need to figure out how we're going to take this idea that everybody likes and put it into a truck and then on a stage. So we had about 41 days of technical development on this project, including drafting, doing drawings for the lighting vendor, video vendor, the set vendor we had for the opening act and the beginning of the show. And we were able to visualize, uh, again, rendering this way, looking at different colors and options for backdrops so the artists could choose which one they'd like. So after we get through that phase, we start the pre-visualization process. So this would include additional renderings, creating to tell the visual story of the show and more specific looks and feel for each song. So these renderings would include actual video content or still frames of samples and actual lighting looks that were desired uh, to help kind of convey the story for that particular song. These renderings would be used on site as a reference when programming, uh, as well as serve as an agreed upon uh, kind of roadmap for the show that we were creating. And they also let us look at video content in context with lighting, which is really important. The artists would provide visual references for content development. So this is a whole bunch of images uh, that the artist sent to us and said, this is the kind of feel of the show. And some of this also includes hand drawings by the artist, which is shown here. So from there, the content company and uh, the screen's producer would take uh, these references and kind of create style frames, test clips, and storyboard out the visual language that would be kind of conveyed on the LED screens. And then we would start to move into the previous process for programming lighting. So this again was myself and the rest of the creative team uh, in LA for about six days at our previous studio, uh, programming each song, sending these videos back to the artists in Nashville for their approval so they can kind of see the direction we're going. Uh, and this allowed us to kind of walk into our fairly limited rehearsal time with the whole show programmed. In this case, we got everything finished and we were ready to sit down and edit and work on the full-scale model. Final phase, implementation, we made our way to Nashville um, and we were in a rehearsal facility we, where we could fit the whole show at, at full scale. And uh, we spent a few days loading the show in, getting the technical aspects of the show worked out before embarking on polishing the show creatively, where we sat with the artists, they sat with us front of house and we'd go through the looks and again, very involved, had great opinions and artistic vision. And that collaboration is a really interesting part of the process. Uh, this show included uh, a bit of a gag that was like a performer lift that lifted the artist 15, 20 feet up, kind of floating in the middle of the, the rig. And he was wearing a mirror ball jacket to complete this, this kind of moment and uh, this kind of night sky look. So it was a pretty cool idea that we all came up with together and were able to uh, execute as shown. The LED strips behind the band uh, were actually pretty unique. They could be programmed like a light with individual control of pixels or segments uh, with intensity and color, or they could be controlled as a video screen, mapping video across them. So we were able to get lots of different textures and looks out of this, and they were a really central part of the design. Uh, on these shows, you end up spending tons of time with the rest of the team you're working with, which is really important. The human factors side of this industry is rarely talked about, but is really, really important. When all the lights and gear and all that stuff disappears, you're kind of left with looking back on these shows and the time you all spent together. And so uh, it's really important to take care of the team you're working with or working for at the same time and uh, appreciate everybody is kind of going through this together. So this was a picture from rehearsals when we ordered an ice cream cake and we had a blast. So the process from start to finish, always unique, always different depending on the show. Uh, and the pursuit of what is great often takes unexpected turns and where you started is not always where you end. And uh, what's really most rewarding is the process, not really the outcome. Hi, Steven Weber here. Exactly two years ago, we began major renovations on the building that houses the Power Station Studios and Berkeley NYC, the New York campus of Berkeley College of Music. Two years, millions of dollars, one pandemic, and the collective efforts of hundreds of construction workers, engineers, acousticians, architects, contractors, and subcontractors later, we're almost ready to reoccupy the building. We're located here in Hell's Kitchen on West 53rd Street between 9th and 10th Avenue, sharing the neighborhood with dozens of Broadway theaters, hundreds of off-Broadway theaters, Carnegie Hall, Radio City Music Hall, Lincoln Center, Alvin Ailey, The Late Show, The Daily Show, major labels, broadcast networks, just blocks from Times Square. 
The first thing you'll notice about the renovations is we now have an accessible ground floor entrance, complete with a new elevator and a ground floor lobby. Our idea was to make the new lobby kind of reminiscent of the old lobby at Power Station. Uh, so we designed it all in wood like this. Brand new reception desk, and we've got Harley Seeger here. Hi, Harley. Hi, good to see you. I'm so excited to be working reception here for Power Station and as the Student Services and Career Coordinator for Berkeley NYC. Our new elevator is huge. It's big enough for a nine-foot concert grand piano and five additional people to ride in at the same time. We're shooting this during COVID times. So if you see me or anybody else without a mask on, keep in mind we are complying with all SAG after COVID protocols. And Power Station is an approved studio for SAG after a use. On the lower level, we've got a nice big lobby here for the Black Box Theater. We're gonna go in there in just a minute, but first, let's head down this corridor here. One of the things I love about the renovations is that we finally now have enough restrooms for this building. This building has been chronically under restroomed for quite a while, but we've made up for that. And then we head down here, we have some writing rooms, and oh, hey, we have uh, Nikki and Regina here. Let's say hello to them. Hey guys. Hey. Hey, listen, I'm giving a tour. Would you introduce yourselves and tell people what you're doing down here? Sure. Hi, I'm Regina. I'm a client service associate. I'm Nikki. I'm also a CSA. And we help facilitate all of the recording sessions that happen here at Power Station. Currently, though, we're in the middle of a co-write in one of the production suites here. What's really cool is that the setups down here are super simple. You just bring in your laptop, your gear, and a pal, plug right in, and you can start get to work. Yeah, and there's three rooms down here just like this, so plenty of space to get writing. Here at the end of the hall, we have another rehearsal space, which can obviously be used for uh, band rehearsals, choral rehearsals. It also could be used very well for dance rehearsals as it has a sprung dance floor. So now we're in the brand new Black Box Theater. This Black Box Theater features an amazing LED wall, which can be configured all together like that or in several different components. It features a fully sprung dance floor. We have a nice green room and dressing rooms. There's a video control room adjacent to here. There's also a pantry for live events. This also features a very impressive lighting grid where Matthew Soares right now is at the console. Matthew, tell us a little bit about the lighting grid. So down here in the Black Box Theater, we have full lighting capability. We have PARs, LECOs, movers, all the industry standard stuff that you would see to light up whatever productions you have. On top of all that, we have this gorgeous QL5 console to sound design or provide audio for whatever you want to bring in here. We're ready for it down here. So this is the video control room. All 26 of the 4K PTZ cameras come down to here. From here, we can do broadcast, we can do live streaming. We can also capture individual camera feeds for post-production later on. Gloria and Simon, do you want to tell us a little bit about the capabilities down here? Sure. We have a live switcher right here, which have a control of all the cameras in our studios. We can also control the camera's pan, tilt, zoom right here in our fingertips. You can bring in a director, producer, and we can do live broadcast like a TV studio. In addition to video tie lines, this room also supports Dante connectivity, which allows us to seamlessly capture audio from anywhere in the facility. Welcome to Studio A. This is a legendary space. It was uh, completed in 1977. Uh, some of the earliest clients was Nile Rodgers and Sheik, Bruce Springsteen, Madonna, Cyndi Lauper, David Bowie, Dire Straits, the band that took the name Power Station, as well as many, many Broadway cast albums. Also in here, you can fill this up with strings, you can put a full orchestra. The acoustics are really the signature of this space and they're defined by the septagonal dome at the top and then the vaulted ceiling that goes way up. Things just sound amazing in here. You can also turn this from one huge space into three pretty large spaces using these movable walls right here where you can keep the sight lines but make this into a huge isolation booth here that's actually big enough for a full band. The flexibility in this space is really incredible. Another new addition to the studio that we're excited about is this Steinway D nine-foot concert grand piano. We made a huge investment in video infrastructure, starting with these PTZ cameras. 
PTZ stands for Pan, Tilt, and Zoom. These are 4K cameras. Here in Studio A, we actually now have 10 cameras. You can do a 10 camera shoot in Studio A without setting up a single camera. We also have some extra cameras that you can bring to bear, some of these Panasonic 4K cameras that were chosen. Or if you wanna go with more of a cinematic look, we also have the industry standard red cameras with the Canon cinema lenses, which look amazing. We've also replaced all of the track lighting with DMX controllable Times Square lighting. Also during the renovations, we were able to give Studio A its own very private and very comfortable lounge, uh, complete with accessible restrooms. Here is the control room for Studio A, and here is Ian Kagi. Hey, Ian. Hey, Stephen. Could you tell our friends a little bit about the uh, control room here? Absolutely. Welcome to the control room for Studio A. Studio A's control room is centered around a Neve 8088 analog console. This console was installed in the facility in 1980, and we spent the last two years refurbishing it and bringing it back to its home. Other upgrades to the facility include Dante throughout all of the studios, multi-channel headphone systems, as well as state-of-the-art Pro Tools systems. Our hope is that we can support great analog gear with also amazing digital infrastructure. So leaving the Studio A lounge, we go right into this elevator lobby, which is pretty nice. Uh, the gallery is over there, but first let's go take a look at Studio B land. Uh, Studio B now has its own dedicated private lounge for artists working in Studio B, where they can hang out between takes. And we have yet another accessible restroom here. Let's head into Studio B itself. Studio B is just a great room to cut a smaller, tight band, a four-piece, a five-piece. There's also a piano alcove over here where you can either open it up or you can close it off with the same type of uh, walls with windows in them that we have in Studio A, which you can also do with these two big ISOs here. What we did add was the PTZ cameras. So you can also do a great video shoot here in Studio B without setting up cameras and being obtrusive. So here's the Studio B control room, which is very similar to the Studio A control room, except that it has Ben Miller in it. Ben, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Stephen, thanks. <laughs> That's great. It also has a 72-channel SSL J9000 series console, which I know has been recapped while we were down. And Ben, could you tell us a little bit about that process? Totally, yeah. The building renovation was an excellent opportunity for us all to get in and spend some quality time with our vintage gear to make sure that when we reopen, it's gonna be better than ever. Studio C is our second largest tracking room. It's almost as big as Studio A. Uh, but one of the great things about Studio C is the way that the ISOs are laid out. We have five isolation booths, all with excellent sight lines back here into the main room. Something else unique to Studio C is that it's the only studio we have that's not entirely finished out in the Sugar Pine, but has what we call the Motown room. Uh, this ISO was finished out in the same materials as you would find in Motown Studios, where Tony Bon Jovi, who designed the place, uh, got his start as a teenager. And hey, we have Brandon here. Brandon, how's it going? Hey, Stephen, how are you? Good, good. Hey, say hello to everybody and tell them what you're up to. Hey, guys, my name is Brandon Shavir. I'm a CSA here at Power Station, just getting these drums set up for our session later. Studio C's control room is equipped with a Neve VR 72 channel console and is also equipped right now with Neil Shaw. Hey Neil, how's it going? Hey Stephen, how are you? Good. My name is Neil Shaw. I'm a uh, studio operations associate here at Power Station. I work with the engineers and clients in the studio to make sure that their session runs smoothly and they have everything they need. This is the Studio G lounge. It's got a nice uh, pantry and it's a nice big space. Walking now into the control room of Studio G, our most popular mix room, and here is the most popular mix guy who designed this room, our chief engineer, Roy Hendrickson. Hey, Roy. How's it going? Great, man. Hey, would you tell everybody a bit about your uh, your long life here at the studio? Sure. I started here in 1985. It was a very exciting time for me as a young man. I get to experience and witness a lot of magic that's happened in these walls. Yeah, you've done tons and tons of sessions here. Around 2004, I was able to convert it into a record mixing room, and I always wanted to get one of these back. Yeah, yeah, the SSL. G series, which is an awesome console. Here's the live space for Studio G, which is the smallest of the live spaces of any of the studios, but it's actually a pretty good size. You can cut a small band in here, some singers, do some overdubs while you're mixing. Hey, here's Aki. Hi. Aki, how you doing? Good, how are you? Introduce yourself and tell everybody what you do here. Okay. 
Hi, my name is Aki Nishimura. I'm a staff engineer at Power Station. I've been here like 14 years from 06. Wow, that's great. Before the renovations, this space actually didn't exist. It was part freight elevator uh, and part just fallow space that wasn't being used in the building at all. Now it's a nice large room that can be used as a classroom, can be used as a rehearsal space. And we were also able to liberate uh, this wonderful window so that students and artists and musicians as they're rehearsing here can take a look at the midtown views. And also it lets in a lot of great light. Now we're in the virtual reality and augmented reality lab. We have uh, three of these Jaunt One cameras, and we also have the amazing Glenn Forsyth. Glenn, where are you right now? I'm in Studio A right now, hanging out with the Berkeley Indian Ensemble. <laughs> That's fantastic. Do you want to tell us just what it takes to put one of these together? Sure. Well, we start with these cameras, which have a whole lot of lenses. Uh, there's 24 different cameras within just one of these. And each has its own SD card, which can hold up to 64 gigabytes, right? Yeah, it's That's a lot of data. Wow. So we have to bring all of that over to our workstation, and then we stitch them all together to create one large video. That's great. And then how do you look at this at the end? Well, there's a bunch of different ways you can enjoy this media. Obviously, we have these wonderful headsets, a bunch of different generations of VR headsets. This is my favorite way to enjoy this. It's the most immersive way, yeah. but you're not limited to this. You can actually watch these videos on your smartphone, even mm -hmm. with a pair of headphones, yeah. or even on a desktop computer on YouTube or on Facebook. And this, of course, is the DJ Lab. We have all sorts of uh, DJ gear here, as well as Ryan Nava, longtime DJ, member of the Scratch Ambassadors, and uh, head of Special Ops. Ryan, tell us what we're looking at here. Absolutely. Well, we got a number of DJ stations here featuring both analog vinyl turntables and the modern digital versions of them. We've also got some analog synthesizers, modern digital keyboards, kind of blending a mixture of the past, present, and pushing towards the future. Here on the third floor, we have a nice big new space that's going to have multiple functions. This area is actually going to be a study area and a hang space. Brett, introduce yourself and uh, let everybody know what you do. Hey everyone, I'm uh, Brett Mayer. I'm part of the technical staff here at Power Station. Then over here, this is going to be the largest tech lab that we hear at Berkeley NYC. There's a place for teaching, there'll be a place for students to bring their own laptops and work and plug into some additional horsepower and some monitors, as well as check out various MIDI controllers. Here in the gallery space, we'll be installing museum quality exhibits, uh, tracing the history of the power station, as well as the New York City recording industry. This is a beautiful new space with a new window. I wanna thank you for joining us on this tour today, and I look forward to welcoming you in the near future to the power station at Berkeley NYC in person. That's it for this episode of The Power Station at Berkeley NYC. This episode was co-produced, edited, and mixed by Glenn Forsyth. Contributors include Simon Yu, Loudon Stearns, Ryan Nava, Matthew Soros, Ian Kagi, Roy Hendrickson, Gloria Cava, Nikki Grande, Regina Avrion, Ben Miller, Brandon Shavir, Neil Shaw, Aki Nishimura, Brett Mayer, Eric Marshwinski, and Charlie Rosen. Power Station Podcast is produced by Stephen Weber for Berkeley NYC. If you'd like to hear more, subscribe. To engage, leave us a comment. Thanks for joining us.